Good evening, everybody, and welcome to King Jordan Radio. The year is 2015, and this is our debut show. And good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us and choosing King Jordan Radio for a very special Monday, January 5, 2015. Tonight on the show, we have a very special guest. He was the bodyguard for Michael Jackson uh, throughout the 2004-2005 trial, plus spent countless months after. He is working on a book that he hopes to have on uh, by the 10-year anniversary of the June 13th 14-count acquittal. And he also is... He also was a LAPD sergeant for 20 years. He's a one of the favorite guests here on King Jordan Radio. His name is Kerry Anson. He joins us now. Good evening, Kerry, and welcome back to King Jordan Radio. How are you, sir? Good evening, Jordan, and Happy New Year to you. Uh, I'm doing great. I feel honored uh, that you uh, allowed me to come back on your show. Absolutely, and... Uh, I'll tell you, we're going into 10 years this June with uh, the acquittal of Michael Jackson. Do you does it feel like it's 10 years, Gary? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, I talk to people all the time about <laughs> when you get over 50, everything goes fast, though. The, the years, it just seems like, you know, last month it was the first of uh, 2014. So I think the older you get, uh, you know, the time passes by much faster. But uh, it, it definitely does not. When uh, somebody mentioned to me that the 10-year anniversary is coming up, it's like, oh, my God, it doesn't seem like nowhere near that, that amount of time has passed by. But it definitely has. It really has. And the technology, uh, YouTube, February will be 10 years as well, on a side note. So that's pretty interesting stuff. But you have, uh, you're working on a book, at least. But uh, I don't want to ask you about the book yet, but I just want to ask you what your intentions are for this book. In other words, what, what desire do you have for writing this book? What do you want to come across uh, with the people that read this book? Well, you know, several... People have uh, questioned me uh, a long time about writing a book, and I just want to uh, get my personal experiences uh, that I had with Michael out, some of them, and I want to uh, shed a little light on Michael and, and his legacy. I think uh, certain people have, are still trying to tarnish his legacy, and uh, I just would like to share a personal side, uh, as personal as I can get quite naturally. I won't, you know, divulge all kinds of things, but I think I'll I'll have a, a book that uh, is quite intriguing to people because they they are you know uh, requesting that uh, they know a little bit more about him and and uh, like I said I, I think uh, his image has been tarnished a little bit and if I can do anything to reverse that and to continue his legacy and and tell the kind of person he was uh, I, I that's what I want to do you know and uh, I also you know, I want to share a little bit about my life as well. Uh, there was life before Michael Jackson, which led me to Michael Jackson, but uh, God has been real good to me, and certain things in my life, I just think it's time to, to get out. And, you know, invariably, I, I talk to a lot of fans still, and uh, a lot of them are very inquisitive about what I did prior to Michael Jackson, and, and I had a uh, very good career with the Los Angeles Police Department, and... Uh, so I just want to, like I say, uh, tell a little bit about myself and uh, tell some personal uh, sides to Michael that I knew that would definitely uh, reverse some of the crap that's going out now. Um, and not to say that Michael was perfect, um, but I'm not perfect either. Um, I think there's only one perfect person, and, and Michael or I weren't one of them, but uh, we were definitely, and we still are very good people, and, and Michael was an amazing individual, and I just hate to see certain things brought out about him that's trying to taint and tarnish his, his legacy. There was a picture that caught my eye, and there were so many fans that saw it, and they and they said so much kind words to you, 
Uh, if they, the fans are listening now and they didn't get a chance to call in, what would you like to say to the fans that give you so much love uh, via social media? Do you have anything to say to them? Man, I love the fans. They're, they're awesome. Uh, I don't agree with all of them, and, and some of them, you know, I communicate with them uh, via social media, Facebook, and some of them even have my numbers. Um, but I, I love them. Uh, they're very passionate about uh, Michael, and uh, I know how much uh, they meant to him. <laughs> like I told you, I think, in one other interview, I think that's the only time I really got chastised by Michael is when I – yelled at one of his fans, but I was only trying to prevent the fan from getting hurt. Michael just didn't like my delivery at the time. Um, but uh, I think the fans are awesome. Um, and uh, I know how much uh, they meant to Michael. I mean, right outside of his, his children and his immediate family, they were there. And no matter where we went, they were there. And he loved them, you know. And uh, they... It was just an awesome thing, you know, no matter where we were on the uh, globe, <laughs> the fans were there some kind of way. I, I didn't understand. You know, I got to know several of them, uh, but they had some just, it appeared to be unlimited resources, you know, in terms of getting to different parts of the world, because wherever we went, they <laughs> found a way to get there, you know. So that's just a, a level of commitment that they had, and you know, I, I've never seen anything like that. I've worked for other celebrities before, and um, I have never seen any fan uh, celebrity relationship like Michael had with his fans, you know. And uh, I, I remember fans would give me certain things and give some of the other guys around us certain things that were in our close proximity security team. And, uh, you know, how if you didn't get that stuff to Michael, you <laughs> you were going to be in trouble, you know, but. I also remember Michael going up to a little storage place that he had where uh, one of the uh, uh, estate managers would, would store all of the fan stuff, and Michael would go in there and just sit down there like a kid at Christmas and look at all of the letters and the the uh, things that the fans would, would give to us to give to him, you know, and... I want them to know that if they ever gave me something or any of my guys to give to Michael, he definitely got it, you know, and he really appreciated it. So there's much love between Michael and his fans. And uh, have you ever seen a superstar that has been passed away for five years with so much love, like uh, every single day uh, with uh, the uh, wonderful websites, um, with, with all the work Luna Joe is doing. Uh, oh, man. Thoughts, yeah. um, They're awesome. You know, um, it's one thing that when you try to, you know, destroy somebody that is anointed, I, I think, and Michael is special. There's only one Michael Jackson. I don't think it'll ever be another one. And uh, I think God uh, just puts certain things in certain people, and he was one of the special ones, and he's not going to be destroyed. His legacy will live forever, but uh, thank God for people like, you know, Jolanda Vandegrift in, in the Netherlands and all that she does and uh, the Munich Countless in others. Germany. Yeah, uh, Deborah yeah. Kunish. You know, uh, thank yes. God for those fans who continue to... MJLP.com. Uh, yeah, they they try to reverse some of this stuff that's, you know, being put out. And it, it won't. You cannot destroy uh, a person like Michael J. Yeah, you, you can try to physically do it, but, you know, like I tell the fans, I know Michael's in heaven, and, you know, what he meant to do, which is to spread love through his music and entertainment, that's not going to be destroyed, and no matter how evil. Evil will never prevail, I don't think, over good. Ultimately, sometimes we don't understand certain things that happen, but uh, his legacy is going to live. And, and it's amazing how you say he's been deceased now for, you know, five years, and he's just as popular, and probably even more so now, you know? So. Oh, no question. Um, I want to touch on a sensitive subject, maybe not. Uh, get your opinion on certain members of his inner circle. Uh, what's your opinion on Arnold Klein? You know what? 
<laughs> I'm going to get into some of those <laughs> issues in my book. I'll just say it like this. My mom, she always told me, if you don't have anything nice to say about any person, then don't don't say anything. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I, I will uh, go into more detail with with uh, my feelings about Arnold Klein uh, in the book, but uh, I'll just you can read between the lines if you if like I said I don't have anything good to say about it so I'm not I'm going to just leave that right right where it is right now and when you you get the book I'll go into some serious detail about what I feel for him okay uh do you have an opinion on Jermaine Jackson who was at the trial I believe every day uh maybe you could tell me if I'm right or wrong about that he was there with Michael uh Every day, uh, at no, the trial and the no, prelim? he was no, no, he wasn't there nowhere near every day. Um, he was there <laughs> a few days, but he wasn't there uh, the majority of the of the days. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I'll go into you know some of that stuff in the book as well. Uh, I think they loved all of the brothers and, and the family members. I think they loved Michael immensely. Um, however, you know, there's imperfection in everybody, and I think there's certain imperfections that, uh, Jermaine had, uh, just like I have, and just like Michael had, but, uh, I don't really have anything, he never really did anything to me, uh, I, I'll, there, there is a chapter in my book that I'll go into where I specifically talk about, uh, the relationship that I saw, uh, with Michael and his family members, but, uh, I, I don't have anything bad to say about Jermaine. Uh, and that's that he and I spent a lot of time. He, he Jermaine, myself, and uh, his wife, uh, Halima, in Bahrain. Right. And we, we got to know each other pretty good then. Because outside of that, I didn't really have any contact with, a lot of contact with Jermaine. Right, right. I, and it seemed that, uh, by all accounts, that Randy was uh, close to Michael, at least during the trial. And leading up to it, you know, we got Tom Mesero. Yeah, well, actually, Randy is the one who facilitated my hiring with 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 Michael. He and I knew each other from a <laughs> a previous law enforcement uh, encounter, and uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we um, kind of met each other on a fluke. You know, I was in a police car, and, and that's a whole other story. But anyway, but Michael, uh, Randy was the uh, he was around out of the brothers, uh, him and Jackie. Oh, and Tito too, but I think Randy and Jackie were were at the trial more than either one of the brothers. And, uh, and Mama. Randy was. Oh yeah, without a Mama. doubt, Mama was there every day. Yeah, Mama was there. Joe was there every day too. I, I'm almost sure. Yeah. Any uh, thoughts on Joe? At least uh, uh, during the trial. Uh, Joe. Joe was a character. <laughs> he, he was. I, I respect all fathers. Uh, I think people have different parenting skills, and just based on some of the, you know, talks that I had with Randy, Jermaine, all of them, um, I think we have different parenting skills, Joe and I, but I respect him as a man. Uh, I look at uh, all of the children that he raised. None of them ever went to prison. You know, none of them are bad guys or anything like that, and they were productive members of society. So I, my hat is off to Joe Jackson. Uh, like I say, some of his management skills and parenting skills, uh, I'm sure that, you know, they, Michael and those guys disagreed at sometimes because uh, you, everybody knows what happens in terms of him not being their manager, him being their manager at one point and then not being the manager at another point. But uh, for the most part, uh, I don't have any issues with, with Joe Jackson. Uh, uh, like I say, all families have certain things in them where you, have issues, but, you know, for the most part, he is a man that raised his family under very uh, adverse conditions at, at the time, you know, in the 60s, and and they prevailed, and that, that family is known all over this world, and uh, if it wasn't for Joe and Catherine, there wouldn't be That's any right. Jackson, so uh, I, I take my hat off to him. Uh, like I say, I don't, I'm not going to bash really anybody. You know, I try to look at the best in, in people. And uh Joe and I we 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 had some interesting times though when I when I did meet him. I think he had a couple of run ins with uh, Michael's different 
security personnel, and I had to set the tone right off uh, that, you know, I work for Michael, and sometimes it, what Michael said went. It wasn't, okay, I'm Joe Jackson, I'm the father, whatever I say. And go, no, not really, because you don't pay me. Michael pays me, so <laughs> whatever he says goes. But I did it with respect and dignity. I, I would never disrespect, uh, you know, uh, Joe Jackson, never, or any uh, parent. You know, you, you try not to. You try to be just respectful and, and dignified. And then, like I say, because he can be uh, quite pushy at times when, he comes up with the I'm Joe Jackson, you know, I, I gotta do this, I gotta, well, okay. Then you gotta use some diplomacy. It's like, okay, Joe, let's let's see if we can do it this way, you know. But I think he's a great man. A man that raised those children and like I say, they're all productive members of society. I've never seen one go to prison over nothing. Hey, they he's a success story if you ask me. Absolutely. Uh the children. Oh. Uh, Paris Blanket and Prince, awesome, uh, very intelligent. Uh, I love those kids. I, I haven't seen them since I left Bahrain, and um, I, I see that they're doing well uh, just based on what I see on social media. Sometimes you can't believe all that stuff, but they're going to be okay. They're very intelligent, and I know how Michael raised those kids, um, so they're going to do well. They're going to do very well. I know uh, as far as business, the business aspect of it, Prince is brilliant. And, oh, my God, he, he's so he, many young he has to be. He has to be. I've seen this kid sit on staircases and read books. And I'm not talking about, you know, the cat in the hat kind of books. I'm talking about books, uh, you know, looking through uh, the history of dinosaurs and I remember one time we he and I went to uh, a bookstore, and he, I guess I mispronounced one of the uh, dinosaurs that I was looking at because we were in a book session, and he was into the dinosaur thing. And, and I said, oh, that's a Tyrannosaurus Rex. He says, no, that's not a Tyrannosaurus Rex. He said some other name I'd never even heard of. I mean, this kid's like, you know, six years old, <laughs> telling me this, but he's he's brilliant, man, and 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 I also know Michael spent significant amounts of time with them, with uh, other things, you know, uh, things that I would say regular kids wouldn't be exposed to, you know, audio and visual equipment and and making things, you know, I've purchased things for him to make movies and stuff, and it's like, wow. Um, but they're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. And and I know Catherine is a loving parent. I know she's an older lady now. But, man, love will prevail, and, and God will get them through this difficult time. And they'll go on to be productive, you know, men and women of society as well. But I, I know that they're going to be smart kids. Uh, and we'll just have to wait and see. Absolutely. We're talking to Kerry Anderson here on King Jordan Radio. Let's go out to the phone line. Let's go out to 678. Please state your name and where you're calling from. It's your turn, and you're on the show. Oh, me? 678. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm J.L. Rucker, and I'm calling from Georgia. And are we just asking questions here? or Questions, comments? Okay. I, I just have... Um, one question for Mr. Anderson. Um, what would you feel is your most memorable moment with Michael? Oh, well, there were several. It's so hard to to pinpoint one. Some were very good and some were very sad, but they were all memorable. Um, I never will forget, uh, you know, uh, just certain times I was driving with him and then, uh, we'd be grooving to music, and then all of a sudden there'd be a sad point, and, and we would like, "Wow, what's going on? What what changed your mood so quickly?" And uh, I even put this on social media where we were riding in Florida, and uh, Michael had a real good day. We had some kind of meeting. We went actually to the meeting, and on our way back to the hotel, we had a, it was a good time. You know, I could tell he was in an upbeat mode, and whatever happened in the meeting w went relatively well. I would assume because he was such an 
an upbeat mood. And uh, then I'm stopped at a intersection, and I thought I heard him like crying. It's like, so I look back at my rearview mirror, and sure he is, he's crying. He, he told me that we were stopped right next to the place where Andy Gibb. Uh, he went and viewed Andy Gibb's body, and Andy Gibb was a very dear friend of his. So that was one of the times. There was another time where I'll never forget the time that I notified him and told him that the verdict was in. That was a very, it was it was a sad time because his children were in there, and they were quite upset. And uh, Grace, one of his uh, assistants, uh, she had to kind of get the kids out. And then I, I just will never forget the, the look on his face. Uh, you know, and I can imagine the pressure uh, on Michael at the time because at the time he didn't know what was going on. I was trying to instill in him that God is going to get you through this and you're going to be okay. But that day that the, uh, when I went up to his room and told him that, you know, I've got a call from the judge and we got to get back to court because then I'll never forget that look on his face. And then happier times, you know, Christmas, uh, were, were awesome. Uh, it, he was a practical joker. You know, I remember one time Michael, uh, he was into, they, they, him and especially Prince, he was into magic tricks. And Michael, uh, I, I stunned them with a, a card trick that I had, and they couldn't figure it out. And, you know, that was a happier time. But um, I also remember times where Michael and I snuck out at night, and he wants to ride in community and we go down to a community he gets out at a lets his window down in traffic and you know just ask a person right next to us the directions and if you had seen the look on that person's face to see michael jackson Mm -hmm. asking them for directions and the the look was like and that's one thing about michael because there's impersonators but once he speaks you'll know that's him and that when he spoke it was like oh my god i was like why would you do that to me you know but there were good times and there were, were sad times. But um, I'll go into several more, too, uh, in the book. But like I said, just to pinpoint one, you know, being with a person, you know, uh, three-plus years and with a person of that magnitude, <laughs> it was never a dull moment. So there's mm-hmm. so many memories, you know. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that helped you? Um, let me see. When when is your book coming out? Uh, I hope to release it on the anniversary date of his acquittal, uh, June thirteenth this year. Mm-hmm. You'll love it, though. Uh, I'm definitely planning on buying it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for the call. Let's go out to I believe this is Long Island. 516, please state your name and where you're calling from. It's your turn, and you're on the phone with Kerry Anderson. My name is Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Sherry. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great, thank you. I'll just tell you what I'm doing. I'm a doctoral student in Muncie, Indiana, at Ball State University. Um, and I'm on Facebook. We're friends on Facebook and other related folks uh, that you've mentioned here, too. Uh, and I'm doing my dissertation on uh, Michael and an aspect of his, some aspects of his life that, but not, um, this is a scholarly work with research that will document, first of all, him as a child prodigy on the same level as Mozart. And I got that from Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, who first started me on this quest of looking into that when he said, if you want to understand Michael Jackson and his ability and and what a phenomenon he was, you got to go back to Mozart, who was the gold standard for child prodigies, basically, in the the scholarly field Um, and in music, classical music. So uh, I just thought I'd tell you that, and then I'm going to talk about other things because I have a background in public relations. I'm going to talk about that, but uh, I'm also designing um, a course uh, where I will teach the different aspects of the research I've done on Michael Jackson. And Carrie, I will be 
probably quoting from your book and citing it, and possibly. Yeah. So these the the this kind of information is quite valuable to me because Michael's archives aren't open if they'll ever be or if I'll ever have access um, in a scholarly way. Um, so this is a uh, very valuable historical information and primary source information from people that knew, knew Michael Jackson that um, that I'll be able to be able to find out about and perhaps one day you'll talk with me one on one but um that's another that's another time okay all right sounds interesting well, i hope i'll yeah. be able to help you yes um yes well i believe so uh but and i i would tell you about it like i said i wasn't prepared to ask for anything tonight even though i should have been but um well, well that's okay. It, it this may not be the forum for, for that. But but you know what, you said we're friends on Facebook, right? You can always reach me via Facebook and uh shoot me your number yeah. and sometimes maybe we can talk at length and if, if I can help you I'd I'd uh be more than welcome to. That'd be great. Because I wanna teach this. I wanna <laughs> teach this online in a Massive open online course. That way, it'll reach a lot of people. But I have to that I have to be set up with an institution and that kind of thing, which is fine because, of, as you know, others. Uh, I'm not a professor at this time, but professors uh, like uh, Mark Anthony Neal at Duke teach about uh, different aspects of Michael's um, performance. He teaches from the performance aspect uh, on Michael. Were you aware of that? No, no, I, I wasn't. So, Are you aware of, uh, there, there's some very uh, amazing people that have some amazing information. Uh, Deborah Kunish and Reflections on the Dance Floor. Have you heard of her? And, and Jolanda uh, Vandergrift from the Nether Netherlands. Yeah, they are I, some, I'm, like some amazing historians. <laughs> As a matter of fact, sometimes I go for them for certain information uh, with dates and times because that's how astute they are uh, with Michael Jackson. Um, yes, uh, and, but, and but they their are. information, yes, and I've talked to Deborah, and and uh, I've and then um, they some of some people out there on Facebook have seen some of the preliminary work I've done on Michael because and. Uh, so yes, all of that is very valuable to me, and and it's been a wonderful help. Um, and so I'll be again, if it's a source that's reliable and can be verified, and uh, is uh, I can I can cite this, and it can go into the annals of history and uh, cultural studies and things that will also uh, help. To yeah. co correct the incorrect information out there and and enhances his legacy as it should be. I uh, understand. Instead of, well, instead of not being I'll, tarnished. Right. Okay. And I'm from Indiana. Okay. So the Jackson Fantastic. family has always been a part of the landscape, even though they left. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Well, pleasure meeting you. And like I said. Uh, We'll be in contact with each other, but I, I, I can speak for those two ladies' character. You know, they do some thorough research in whatever yeah. they put out, and uh, they have some amazing character, and they love Michael. So uh, yeah. I think and between the three of us, and, and we will be able to help you out. All right. Well, happy great. New Year. And I, I, happy New Year to you. I'll, I'll be in touch. Okay. God bless you. Thank, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for the call. Okay, we have a uh, Facebook uh, question coming from Zita. Oh, uh, is Kerry familiar with the people surrounding Michael's family now? And if so, is he concerned with the surrounding security, uh, caregivers, etc.? No, I don't know any of them. Um, and that's my answer. I, I'm not in any kind of contact with any of his security personnel. Uh, I don't know any of them. I really don't. 
Okay, uh, very interesting uh, indeed. And uh, the book, uh, a lot of people are uh, definitely uh, looking forward to this book. But uh, some of the people, uh, I want to uh, you to tell that great story you told. Um, I think it was on the birthday bash, yes, where uh, you had to buy a computer or something along those lines. And then, the, it, well, I think you know the story, the, the Christmas story. That, uh, oh Michael yeah, Jackson. yeah. That was yeah, one of my share that again. more, more that was an memorable awesome stories. Yeah, it was. Um, Michael called me up to his room once, and it was right around Christmas time, and uh, I think probably two or three days before Christmas. And he told me he had such a very special friend uh, that he wanted to get uh, the best computer for, and he wanted his friend. His friend did a lot of traveling, and. Uh, he wanted his friend to be able to do anything from this particular uh, computer and to get a very nice carrying case, and he wanted him to be able to print and get the top-of-the-line computer for this dear friend of his. So I did that, and he said, make sure you wrap it real nice. And uh, I did that, went to the store, and I'm not real computer savvy, so I asked one of the guys at Best Buy, um, I need the best computer and the best printer and the most compact and the guy said okay this is it and so i i got the computer it? spent this was two thousand four what, what two thousand four i think yeah this was two thousand four mm-hmm. and right. uh so i got i got it and uh had it nicely gift wrapped spent a lot of money on it you know you can imagine when you tell a person <laughs> i want the best computer at a you know, one of these retail stores, what it can cost, you know. So I did oh, that yeah. <laughs> and re- returned, <laughs> returned back to um, uh, Michael's residence. And I told him, okay, here it is. And uh, he says, okay, that's fine. So I put it under a tree or whatever. And I think a day before Christmas, Michael told me that he wanted me to be with my family and Everything is cool. If he needed me, he could, you know, get me to return back to uh, where we were. And just before I, I left, he says, well, um, we have a Christmas gift for you. And actually, I think, uh, I don't know, all the kids were there, were there, but they presented me that same gift that I had just purchased two days prior. And it just, man, it was, I'll never forget that as long as I live. You know, for him to categorize me as a very dear friend, you know that 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 says something. You know, because it, you know, oh, yeah. in, in an exec, executive protection type job, you're not supposed to get really personally involved with your client. But this was a right. different kind of setting. Michael was a loving, kind, generous person. I'll, I'll go into detail more in the book. Talk about some of his generosity and some of the gifts that he he gave me and some of the gifts that I saw him give other people. Uh, you wait till I hear you, the story with what I saw him do for Tito. One day. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, wow, I need a brother like this, man, you know. <laughs> but what a loving, he, that guy is amazing, man. And, and, you know, that's one of the main things that it's like we got to get this out because they bombard him with BS and with negative stuff you know, with, you got this Wade ropes and stuff coming up, and they, they they just won't let the man rest in peace, even though I know he's in heaven and, you know, probably just laughing at this stuff. But I'm going to do whatever I can to, uh, you know, counter-assault what these people are doing that's trying to ruin his legacy, you know, because that's not the person that I knew. And I think I'm a very good judge of character, especially... You know, sometimes you get it wrong, but I don't get it wrong by living with a person for two and a half to three years. And, you know, I know this man. I know what he didn't do. I know what he did do. And that's not to say that, you know, uh, none of us, nobody's perfect. You know, all of us have imperfections. Michael had his, I got mine, and everybody that's under the sound of my voice, I'm sure they have imperfections as well. But as a genuine, just a godly person who cared about people and cared about the voiceless and cared about the underprivileged and and just cared about humanity you know whether you were black white blue what yellow whatever 
you know, and that's why people love him all over the world. They can see through, um, you know, when the media tried to destroy him, they can see through that, you know. Love will always, it will never fail, and Michael was about love, you know, so that was, I'll never forget that. I still got that computer, and it it still works, and I got a lot of stuff on there, you know. (laughs) That computer went all over the world with me. (laughs) <laughs> really, you, really, it was just it was know? awesome, man. They they blew me away with that. You know, the kids, all of them, came up to me and said, "Here, this is it, Carrie." It's like, and I was like, "You talk about a, a jaw dropping kind of experience." You can imagine, you know. But it uh, it would it it brought tears to my eyes. It really did, and it just boosted the level. Awesome. I already, yeah. What I was your reaction when you first got? What was your huh? reaction when that gift? When that gift was coming your way, and then you oh, you, you knew what was going on, what were you what were you saying oh, to yourself? I, like, oh, I, I, shit. Just, man, it was, <laughs> I couldn't believe it, man. You could imagine getting a gift like that, you know. I think you saw. Right. I think, man, that that computer was it was it was a, a nice piece of change, you know. You talk about yeah, a Sony yeah. Vio, especially back then. Sony Vio, then. Pentium Four. What is, yeah, it was some serious money, you know, but. Ten years it was ago, just, it, not only it. was it um, not only monetarily was it a lot, but just what it meant to have somebody say, you know, the things that he said prior to me getting the gift, you know, and it's like, wow, I'll never forget that, you know. So absolutely it was, it was a great time. Yeah, let's go out to uh, four four one six is the area code. Please state your name and where you're calling from. You're on the phone with Kerry Anderson. 416, it's well, your turn. Good evening, Carrie. It's Maria from Canada. Hey, Maria, how are you? How's Anna? I'm good. How are you? Anna's good. good. She's listening good. as we speak. And thank you for taking my call, King Jordan. Um, I wanted, You know what I wanted to ask you, Carrie, is um, I was listening in and you talking about you getting the call from the judge that you know on the day of the verdict. Uh-huh. And how was the uh, car ride home? What was that like for Michael? Um, it was not not good. He was in a weird no. mood. You know, I, I don't, I, I can't. It was a very emotional day. Uh. And it's kind of hard to remember because the ride up there, I, re- I remember that very distinctly. And um, it, it was chaotic, you know. But um, the ride home, I, I don't really remember a lot. I, I know his mood was just so, I don't think he, I think it was like a state of shock. Was it silent? I, was I, there talking? Was there? No, there wasn't a lot of talking. You know, it was very mm-hmm. jovial outside the car. You can look at the footage because this was a free man. And only, you know, several seconds before, we didn't know where his freedom would lie. Um, but it was just a, a weird moment, you know. Um, right. I don't re- really remember too much of it. Um, but because, I, 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 you know, Michael was very emotional. Um but it wasn't jovial and celebratory or anything like that. No. Because he was mm-hmm. just so, like, in shock, I think. You know, and, and then I'll go into, in my book, I'm going to go into the chapter where, you know, the verdict day and, and what happened when we went into court. And, and there's some things that, that went on that, that'll be a very interesting read. Um, but the ride uh, going was, it was unbelievable. I, I actually, I... Uh, Catherine was very upset. Uh, Joe was kind of, he was interesting. And it, it was not a good ride on the way to court. Okay. Very emotional. And uh, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, I came out with a scripture. And I had written this scripture and put it in my pocket prior to uh, going to court that day. And I think it was Isaiah 43 where it talked about uh, those that come against you will be as nothing and I've got you, and it was basically a reassurance uh, that I had given to, I turned around and gave it to Catherine because she was just so emotionally upset. And I said, mm-hmm. everything's going to be all right, and I told her to read that. And Joe was Joe was really freaking out that day. He was, 
I don't know what his his disposition was totally different, but Catherine was emotional. I turned around and gave that scripture to her, and she said, "Here, Joseph, read this." And he mm-hmm. shut up the rest of the way. He was totally silent <laughs> the rest of the way. So you know, it was, uh, and I like I said, I'll go into more details about it. Well, uh, Terry, in the book, thank but, God for you in that car. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. I, I tell you what, thank God for all of the praying and fans. Do you, and um, do you uh, keep in touch with any more of the family? No, I, I haven't I, I, I missed, no. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I wanted to say I, I missed part of the beginning of the interview, so I don't know if you already answered that. No, no, that that has not, I don't think, well, I think we touched on a little bit, but I don't have any contact with, with either one of them now. I don't, I don't. Uh, have any contact whatsoever with them. Um, mm-hmm. I haven't heard from them. I'm just I only get the information from social media and and what other uh, Twitter and that that kind of thing that that people mm-hmm. uh, talk. But I don't have any real contact with with either. Well, of I'm them really uh, looking forward to the release of your book, and I'll make sure everyone sees it from my end. Okay, go Canada. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> Say hello Thanks, to your Carrie. kids. They look great. I, I see them online, and and I know that song Thank came you. out good Sunday. I, you, I I know you guys sang beautifully. <laughs> you and Anna. <laughs> Take okay, care, though. God, God bless, bless you. you. Bye All bye. Right. Thanks for the call. Okay, it's time to talk about Mr. Michael Brown. But before we do that, I want you to hear a clip from Lisa Bloom, and then we'll talk on the other side. I'm ashamed for my justice system that is so good at protecting celebrities and authority figures and so pathetically bad at protecting the ordinary person, especially when that's an African-American person assaulted by a white person, especially a police officer. I mean, there's no question about it. What we saw from Bob McCullough tonight was a defense attorney presentation dressed up as a prosecutor doing the presentation. He talked about conflicting evidence. There's conflicting evidence in every case. We wouldn't be the land of mass incarceration if every case was treated the way this case was treated. Conflicting evidence means you can't even charge a man. I mean, that was just so outrageous and disturbing to me. There's no question that Darren Wilson got special treatment. I wished one of the reporters would have asked Bob McCullough about that. Why don't all of the other defendants in St. Louis get the treatment that Darren Wilson got, which is a prosecutor who doesn't want to file charges himself, a prosecutor who has close ties to where the defendant works, a prosecutor who puts on all of the evidence, meaning all of the defense evidence, and then doesn't request any particular charges to be filed. I mean, this prosecutor bent over backwards to ensure that there would not be charges filed. And many of us, myself included, have said all along that we would be absolutely shocked if there was an indictment because he rigged the system to get the result he wanted. He got that result. And he never explained in that press conference why Officer Wilson feared for his life, the most important fact in this case. He said that Officer Wilson shot Mike Brown twice in the car. That means that a twice shot bleeding Mike Brown is running away. Officer Wilson knows he is not armed. Even if he came towards him again, why would he be threatened for his life? Why would he have to shoot him in the head and kill him in that moment? And unfortunately, Bob McCullough never answered that question. Terry Anderson, your take on what you just heard and the Mike Brown case in a whole. Wow. Well, she was fired up, you know. I don't know. <laughs> yes, I think it was. That, that's interesting. She had some very good points. And, you know, I don't know what the final outcome of that is going to be. I know one thing I talked about in my last interview with you is one thing Martin Luther King said. He says, truth crushed to earth will one day rise again. And I have some very difficult issues with the Ferguson thing just based on the non-transparency you know, nobody knows what happened. I wasn't there. Uh, you weren't there. And some people were there, but uh, I, I don't know. It's we we got to do something with uh, law enforcement uh, and the relationship that they have with the communities that they're serving. And uh, I can listen to the passion in that lady's voice. Uh, 
And there's a lot of people in this country that feel the same way, uh, not saying that they're advocates for Mike Brown um, or advocates for Darren Wilson. But the thing is, is police officers uh, now are, are getting a bad rap rep because people are genuinely afraid of policemen. And right. I'm not saying the majority of people, but there are a lot of people that are afraid of police officers now, as opposed to, that's not what you're supposed to be, a, the, the kind of attitude and disposition you ha, you, you're supposed to have uh, for your police officer. You're supposed to be able to go to that person for protection and for them to get you out of a jam, you know. But that's not the case, and it has deteriorated over the years, I think, based on... Uh, the relationship now, and it, and it's it's a systemic issue. Uh, there's several issues that that uh, cause this to happen. I think uh, unfair hiring practices. I think uh, institutional racism, uh, lack of training. Uh, uh, and when I say lack of training, I'm talking about actual uh, police officer survival tactics as well as sensitivity training. Uh, I think the proliferation of all these video games, it, I think it desensitizes uh, people's, uh, you know, regard for life. I don't think life means as much uh, to people now. And, and you're dealing with a generation that is coming up in this video game, and you look at some of these video games, and I think that really impacts people because you look at the people that are involved in law enforcement, and, you know, it's coming from basically 21 years of age, which are very young people, that's when I started, to, you know, you get up in 20 years on the job, you're 40, 45, 50 years old. But if you look at that generation, it's the video game guys, and I don't know, and, and then you have people coming out of war, and then I, I think um, there's things that have to be addressed with regards to testing the sanity and testing the psychological makeup of police officers you have to continuously train, but I also think they have to continuously be to be monitored so that some of these crazy mindsets, if they do exist, they have to be taken care of or that person has to be taken out of the field. But we, we do have a problem with law enforcement, and uh, we're going to have to sit down at the table. I, I remember uh, right at uh, when Police Chief Willie Williams came, and he was – supposedly a community-based policing czar, like, and uh, he was coming in to restore uh, the relationship between the Los Angeles Police Department and the community that it served, because it was just where the nation is right now. It was terrible. The people didn't trust the police. They thought the police were corrupt, and, you know, that was all after the Rodney King verdict. Well, you're, you're dealing with the same kind of issues now. The only issue that I see is the lack of leadership in not getting these guys to sit down at the table. And I think uh, President Barack Obama has come up with some kind of system that he's trying to get this to happen. I know he appointed the, uh, the, the police commissioner of Philadelphia to be the czar over this thing, and apparently they're going to uh, convene several... Uh, chief of police, and then they're going to convene several people within the various communities uh, that the chiefs serve, and, and they're going to sit down at the table to see if there's some kind of, we got to come to some kind of uh, agreement or see where, if we can sit down with the various people of the communities. And I'm talking about from all socioeconomic backgrounds. I'm talking about different cultures, uh, obviously different races, uh, you got to have rich, you got to have poor, you got to have the clergy. You got to, I would, and as a matter of fact, at, at some of the uh, community police advisory board meetings that I went to, we had gang members that were a part wow. of this process. I mean, they're part of the community. Why can't we sit down even with some of them and find out, okay, we got to admit some of the things that we're doing that is wrong, but you guys, meaning the law enforcement side, you have to admit some of the things that you're doing wrong. And maybe we can sit down at the table and figure out if we do have some kind of commonality, you know, 
and then we'll go from there. But the opposite of that is war. If you don't want to sit down at the table, then the opposite of that is let's go to war. And the only bad thing about war is people are going to die in war, and there's always going to be a casualty, you know. So we we have to address it as a nation, and uh, it, it's going to take some work, um, but it's going to take some very good leadership, and uh, it's going to take some some serious changes within our departments, within our hiring practices, and uh, because, like I say, it's not just based on an individual. Yeah, I, I don't know Darren Wilson. Um, I don't know Mike Brown. But, right. um, you know, you, and nobody knows that exactly what happened. I, I don't know what happened. I tell you what, I have some serious problems with the grand jury system, the judicial system, that uh, the Eric Garner case was, I, I got problems with that. I got problems with the, 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 the transparency. It, it's just not good. You know, and people don't trust law enforcement, you know, like they did. And trust has to be earned. It's got to be developed and nurtured. And and it, and it's two sides to that as well, you know. But I think you, you have to be mature about it. Uh, I, I look at some of the uh, statements from some of these union rep guys that are representing the police officers. And, and one was the Cleveland, uh, the Ohio uh, president of the Ohio Police Officer Association or whatever, how he jammed the right. NFL player for coming out. That's out of line. You know, that's that's a First Amendment right, your freedom of expression. And and to me, it's like, how dare you say that's disrespectful? And he even alluded to that the fact that, you know, well, you guys should be grateful that we're providing security for you. Hello? The NFL, you don't think that they could get another outside security agency to police that stadium? Police officers are probably working off-duty uh, jobs doing that, That you know, working overtime. You know, so I don't know. I just think it was irresponsible, and I think you got to be very mature and you got to be humble and you got to be willing to sit down at the table and listen to both sides, you know, because I think there's idiot police officers. I know they're idiot criminals. But I also know that right. they're idiot police officers, and some of them have, are just horrific, meaning the law enforcement side, you know. And I, I think uh, some people say, well, you know, should they be held to a higher standard? Absolutely. I think a person that has the ability, to, and the ability and the authority to restrict a human being's freedom to conduct a preliminary investigation and make an arrest and use whatever force is reasonable and necessary to affect that arrest, that person has to be right. You cannot come in with your personal prejudices and, and racist views and impose those views and, and allow that to impact your authority. That, that's not right, you know. And, and, and the other side, you know, criminals, they got to be held accountable for what they do as well. But... To me, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I don't like criminals, but I also don't like bad cops. So um, we got no to work question. With that, that's for sure. We definitely do. I do want to ask you about Eric Gardner, but I want you to hear a cut from uh, Bill O'Reilly, and then I want to get your opinion Bill on the warning. other side. Viewer warning: We are going to show you some graphic video of the confrontation. On July 17th, New York City police confronted 43-year-old Eric Gardner in Staten Island. Gardner, a low-level street dealer of illegal cigarettes, was not happy to see the police. Everybody's standing here, they I didn't do nothing. I did not sell nothing. Because every time you see me, you want to harass me, you want to stop me, you try to sell a cigarette. I'm minding my business, officer. I'm minding my business. Please just leave me alone. I told you the last time. Please just leave me alone. The officers wanted to place handcuffs on Mr. Gardner, who and the officers were initially cautious. But when they moved in, the worst happened. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Yeah. 
<sighs> Mr. Gardner died at a hospital a short time later. The medical examiner calling his death a homicide, thus the grand jury. Mr. Gardner had a record, mostly nonviolent offenses, was out on bail at the time of the confrontation. New York City police policy is that chokeholds are not allowed. And Mayor Bill de Blasio is clearly on the side of the Gardner family. We'll get to that situation, which is volatile, in the next segment. Now, the officer who used the hold, Daniel Pantaleo, was called before a grand jury and testified for two hours. He's now free and clear of any local and state charges, but the feds say they will investigate the case. Talking Points does not know what happened. And until we read the grand jury transcripts, which are sealed right now, nobody can know. But that does not stop some agitators from stirring up controversy. However, however, I will say that upon seeing the video, that you just saw and hearing Mr. Gardner say he could not breathe. I was extremely troubled. I would have loosened my grip. I desperately wish the officer would have done that. Eric Gardner was obese. He had asthma. He was in no condition to absorb what befell him. Yes, he should not have resisted. But all Americans, every one of us, should pity Mr. Gardner and his family. He did not deserve what happened to him. And I think Officer Pantaleo and every other American police officer, every one, would agree with me. He didn't deserve that. And that's the memo. Now for the top story reaction. Joining us from Los Angeles, commentator Tavis Smiley. Is my assessment of the situation fair, first of all? I, d I didn't know what to expect when I came on tonight, Bill, but I am pleased to hear you say uh, some of what you had to say. But the bottom line for me uh, is when you suggest earlier that we don't know what happened. No, you, were, you weren't there and I wasn't there, but that video camera is abundantly clear to anyone who will watch it what happened that day. And what we have here is, as you've already noted, uh, an illegal chokehold uh, caught on tape. The, uh, the coroner says that this is a homicide. End of story. There is no way in my mind or anybody else's mind, I believe, that's looking at this for what it is, that we can justify a no indictment from this grand jury. It just doesn't add up, Bill. All right, let me play devil's advocate. First of all, the chokehold is not illegal. It's against department policy. It's not illegal. That's illegal. That, that's illegal. Against department policy is not a criminal offense. It's a disciplinary you, 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 you're, you're action. You're splitting, you're splitting, you're splitting, you're splitting no, hairs. No, no, no. It was wrong for him Tavis, to do it. let me explain. Right. The officer was docketed. He lost his shield. He lost his gun. When you violate New York City department policy, that is what happens to you. You're not prosecuted. Now, the prosecutor in Staten Island took it a step further because the medical examiner rightly said it was a homicide because the man died. Mm -hmm. In, in a violent confrontation. So, the grand jury sits, as many as 25, it's more, far more than Ferguson, and you've got to get 12 grand jurors in New York State to say, yes, there should be an indictment. They said no. I'm with you that I saw what happened, and it was very troubling. I don't think the police officer meant to kill Mr. Gardner. I don't think he went in with that. He meant to stop him from resisting arrest. Are you with me so far? Do you agree so far? I, 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 dis, I disagree in the sense that the grand jury saw evidence, and I don't know what they saw in addition to what we saw, but there's no way, Bill, you could look at that videotape and come back with a no indictment, period. I, I mean, I, we, we, can go, we can go all around the block here. When, you, when you're applying something that's against department policy, it's caught on tape, the coroner once again says it's a homicide, how do you come back with no indictment? Here's my point. This grand jury system is becoming a fraud. Prosecutor now because they want to act like uh, this was done under due process they turn to these grand juries these grand juries continue to turn back these uh, to, to, to send out these no indictments and the value of black life in this country continues to continues every day to have less and less respect that's the bottom line 
I want to hear from the grand jury. I want and, and the prosecutor over there, the DA in Staten Island, is trying to get the transcripts released. They're sealed right now under law, and I think he will. I think the public's going to have to see the rationale behind it. I suspect it has something to do with the man resisting arrest and the police officers trying to get him under control, and that the grand jurors believe that they were not doing it in a malicious way. The intent wasn't. Um, Bill, what the Bill, Bill, does, Bill, Bill, does it does it matter? Bill, Bill, honestly, let me ask you, my friend. Does it really matter that he didn't intend to kill him? Does it really matter it does that it matter wasn't done maliciously? As far as charges are concerned, I, look, Bill, Bill, I, well, Bill it, what, ma what matters is that he violated department policy. We saw it on tape. The coroner, I repeat for the third yeah, time, right. said it's a homicide. There and nothing so, comes certainly back. explanations have to be made. Now, I think this would have happened to a white guy doing the same thing. I don't think it had to do with skin color. I think it had to do with poor judgments made by but the group the of evidence, police officers. But, but here's the problem. That what you've just offered now is speculation. It is. Let me put on the table the fact. Let me put, let me put but the other way is speculation, me, too. On Tash. the table, though. No, it's not, Bill. Bill, hold up. It's not. What you're offering is speculation. What I'm putting on the table for America to see, what America does, in fact, see every day, are the facts. The facts are that Trayvon Martin was not speculation. Michael Brown was not speculation. Renisha McBride is not speculation. Sean Bell is not speculation. Eric Garner is not speculation. Right, let me, let me These stop are you facts. There. And black life is okay. being, there's no respect for the humanity Tavis. and the dignity of black life in this country. Let me ask you a couple of questions, Tavis. Sure. Do you know how many blacks were killed by police by gunfire last year? In 2012. I do not know that number. No, the number is 100 and 123. Do you know how many whites okay. were killed? 326. And? There are okay. 43 million plus black Americans. 123 were killed by police gunfire, and very and, and the Gardner thing is is, is most of those uh, police uh, deaths are gunfire, not the other. Mm -hmm. So there isn't an epidemic of this. I mean, it's not. But when it happens, it's extremely troubling. I could be wrong. There's a, Bill, Bill, there's, there's a, I, think, I think respectfully, I think you are wrong. There's a pattern here, and you but are the too, you is are too smart and too though. bright. It's Bill, a minuscule pattern. Minuscule. Bill, well, 123 Bill, tell, opposed hey, Bill, to 43 Bill, hold on, hold on. million Bill, is minuscule. Bill, 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 tell the parents of these precious young children Everyone that it's is minuscule. To life. If it were Bill, if it were your child, if it were a child, you would not call this minuscule, Bill. That's disrespectful, my what friend. I, it's not minuscule. That's disrespectful. You're, you're taking my remarks out of context. It's it's not minuscule no, that not. the man I'm, I'm died. I'm telling you, it's not minuscule. The, the amount of police shootings are minuscule, and more whites, do you three not see, to one, Bill, are do killed you not than see, blacks. Let me ask you, Bill, do you not see, in the era of the first black president, I might add, do you not, for those who thought we were going to live in a post-racial America because he got elected, which was nonsense then, obviously nonsense today, do you not see a pattern here no. where, where black life is being devalued? I don't, because Bill? the statistics don't say there's a pattern. Once again, a hundred and 23 deaths out of 43 million plus is minuscule. Every death is a tragedy. I'm with you. Exactly. Three That's times as many whites are shot dead by police than blacks. I don't think there more, there, there, it's there hunting more, down more, blacks. Bill? Bill, there are more there are more white folk in this country sure. than there are blacks. Absolutely, not for, not for too much longer. But the clear, I think there's a message here tonight that most Americans see that it's open season, hunting season on black men. All right, I disagree, but I respectfully disagree. And you're a stand-up yeah. guy for coming on in. Uh, Tavis's book, Death of a King, about Martin Luther King, is available everywhere. Okay, our pal Tavis Smiley from Blog Talk Radio, all fired up uh, with uh, Bill O'Reilly. Your opinion? Mm -hmm of uh, what he had to say, uh, Mr. Kerry Anderson. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm with Tavis on that. I think, uh, you know, one of the things, this, this whole thing of this, this grand jury thing and the public not being able to witness any kind of testimony or, or whatever, it, it's bad. It, it doesn't do anything to, you know, heal the wounds that have been opened uh, in the in the police community relationship, and um, I just I'm with Tavis on on that one. Uh, I don't think that you know Bill O'Reilly mentioned something about the and he he didn't have any intention. But what what uh, people are talking about, meaning the protesters, are is accountability and culpability. Was he culpable? Yeah, he was culpable. When when you step over the 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 line. 
uh, and it, it's semantics. And he said ta- he talked about splitting hairs as it relates to whether it was illegal or not. If the department policy, if you violate it, and as you're violating it, you cause the death of someone, you have to be handled. You were culpable, okay, whether you intended to do it or not. There is some culpability there. You have to be held accountable. And I think one of the things that, speaking on the community side, that's what they want to see. Um, you want to go through, you want to see somebody cross-examined. You, you don't want this dark room grand jury thing going on and you, you're coming back with something that's just ridiculous, you know. And I don't know, I'm, I'm with Tavis on, on that one. I, I, I love law enforcement, but I love responsible and proper law enforcement. Um, that's the bottom line. And I think police right. officers uh, have to be held accountable for their actions. Uh, they are making some tremendous mistakes now, and I think we made the same mistakes. I think one of the issues now is these video cameras are everywhere, surveillance is everywhere, everything is recorded now, and you have to conduct yourself. So you've got to really think about that when you put the uniform on especially if you have some ill feelings towards the people that, that you're serving, you know, because emotions can fly high and and things can go wrong. Um, but I, I'm with Tavis on that. I, I think uh, that it was an injustice done with the judicial system. I would have loved to have seen um, this before a court, and I would love to have seen someone cross-examine um, Darren Wilson, as well as uh, yes, uh, Officer Spagnelli, or I, I can't pronounce his name, but you know, <laughs> it, it's just it's just ridiculous uh, that 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 non-indictment was was ridiculous. I, I I thought, and like I say, I am not uh, anti-police. I was a policeman for over twenty years, um, but I'm anti-irresponsible and and bad policing. You know, I think. Uh, for if you, you just switch the the, the roles, let's, let's use another. Let's use the um, Catholic priest. If you identified a Catholic priest as being a sexually abusive to some of his members, uh, right? The mere fact that you bring awareness by protesting to this priest behavior, that doesn't mean you're anti-Catholic. That just means you're anti-priest. That priest should be removed. The same thing with education. You got a teacher who is inadequate, who's not doing anything. They're, the teachers are not teaching and, and instructing like they should. Um, that teacher should be held accountable. And just because you're the person that's protesting, saying this teacher is not doing A, B, C, and D, and this teacher's violating department policy, doesn't mean you're anti-education. It just means you're anti-bad teaching. You know. So I think we have to rid uh, police officers that are bad, and read teachers that are bad, read uh, doctors that are bad, if they don't want to do the job. Because I, I think that there are uh, some amazing people out there, talented people that can step into that place and um, adhere to what changes management is going to do as it relates to building partnerships in the community and moving forward. You know, but you, you see the arrogance of like the New York guys. You know, New York is a professional law enforcement agency. Uh, they're, they're big. But I think it's just terrible that they're turning their backs on the mayor at their falling officer's funeral. That's not that's not class, man. Uh, you know, and that's not professional. You know, uh, I don't care who. I mean, I know they're... Uh, I, I was a very aggressive police officer, but I was fair, I was firm. Right. I was respectful, and I te- uh, uh, approach people with dignity. You know, no matter who you are, as a rule, you, you started off, sir or ma'am. Now, it could go to something else after that once you demonstrate that you're an idiot because I have to let you know that I'm legally here <laughs> and right. I'm in charge. You know, uh, I'll, I'll go into several stories in the book about this. But you start off, you know, you start off right. You start off with respect and dignity. You can always get in the gutter with a guy to, to, to let uh, him know who's the pilot of the ship, you know. But 
um, I don't know. We 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 got to do something with this judicial system. We got to do something uh, with with the mindset of some of the policemen. One of the other things that I wanted to bring to your attention, and and I noticed it in the Walmart shooting, uh, where 22 year old uh, John Crawford the third was was killed. The Tamir Rice right. shooting. Uh, the, oh, the, yeah. the the officers' tactics are deplorable on on those instances. You know, sometimes in LAPD, we had officer involved shootings. I've been in officer involved shootings. You can be in a, in a shooting where it's justified, but you had bad tactics, which means okay, it's justified that you shot this guy, but kind of uh, you know escalated this thing. I'll give you a case in point, if you look at the Tamir Rice shooting, that's the twelve year old kid that was Cleveland. You know, on the right in Cleveland. And he had the gun out, the, right? Yeah, the way Big those gun. officers de, yeah, the way those officers deployed on that guy. Now, I understand that that's sometimes crazy. you you yeah, you there's sometimes you opinion. can drive up you can get a bad address and you drive up to the suspect and there he is, bam. But I, from my understanding and my knowledge of the case, that that wasn't the case. They got a good address. They they knew exactly where he was. Why did they not deploy, you know, 70 yards back, open their doors, stay behind cover, get on the PA and order this guy out? I guarantee you, if they had done that, we wouldn't be talking about Tamir Rice today, okay? And there were some other issues involved in that. And, but, you know, it's like, why did they? It, it seems like they wanted to kill this guy. Same thing in the Walmart shooting. I, I would never walk up to a Walmart, and I know all that stuff about active shooting. I, I, I know you can't tell me anything about, you know, oh, you're you're not a cop. Yeah, right. I've done anything. I've been in, involved in some hairy situations. I would not roll up to a Walmart where I got a call that somebody was in the store pointing a gun at people and just run into the store. I don't care if you had an active shooter or not. You you still have to use tactics because you don't want to become part of the problem and and exacerbate the problem. You are there to save lives and protect people, you know. But I don't know the mindset now and the training is 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 different. And I, and like I said when I earlier alluded to how these video games have desensitized, you know, people's they're uh, they're they're. They're. Uh, I don't know. It seems like they don't value life anymore. It's like a video game. It seems like, it seems like these people, some of them want to kill people. And I know that that kind of person exists on the police department. When you say video games, yeah. are you referring to, like, social media, telephones, and all the new you stuff? No, I'm talking there? about these games that, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto oh, and okay. some of these violent, violent Auto, uh, right. commando games that you see these, right. these people playing. And I think it really desensitizes because some of the video footage is HD. It's I mean you got blood splattering all over the place, and yeah, I mean, it, it kind of I think if you play that and play that and play that, and some of these guys based on their generation that they're in, they played those games. They're in that game. They're coming out of the military. Maybe that is some of the mindset that is affecting their psyche or something. I, I don't know, but. It seems like in some of the instances and in, in some of these shootings, patience. They always taught us you you have to be patient. You look at the Kevin Gar the Eric Garner situation. You say, okay, those guys were probably just based on their uh, they weren't in uniform, okay. But uh, why didn't they deploy a taser? They could have tased that guy, you know. And they right. said, okay, well we didn't have a taser with it. Well, what's wrong with waiting? Ultimately, I saw some uniformed guys there. Somebody should have had a taser. And you got a guy that's six foot six, three hundred eighty some pounds. They have tasers that will make him into a little kitty cat. You know, one shot of a taser, and you can turn it on and turn it off. And it wouldn't have been. And I feel for that uh, officer's the officer who who got involved in it and using that modified carotid or that bar arm that he that chokehold that he used. That stuff is. So illegal now, you know, and um, I think had they exercised some patience and waited on a taser, you wouldn't have even had to have tied up with a person like that, you know, and not only that, but I think it was deplorable of the first date that that, that Mr. Garner got. That was ridiculous. 
had they set that man up on his, uh, you, you just set him in a seated position with his legs out and pulled his shoulders back. They teach you all of this stuff. Well, they taught us. You know, there's a way to, obviously he was down and out when, when they were choking him, but, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think the, the, the force was reasonable and necessary at, at that particular time. And then, like I said, the care that he received afterwards, I think the care of the EMS workers was deplorable. I think the care that each and every one of those officers standing by, I actually think that man died right out that scene. I, I don't think he died at the hospital. You know, I, I really don't. Really? I, I, and I can't say that for certain. No, I don't think that. No. I don't actually, he, he may have had a pulse, but if you actually look at the video, uh, and I felt bad for the EMS workers that responded because they come up as like, what the heck is this? But it even took them, <laughs> they always teach you airway, yeah. breathing, circulation, you know, the ABCs of, of, you know, first aid. And it's like, it even took that person long enough to, they didn't even take his pulse in an expedient fashion. It's like, this guy is down, man. He didn't shoot any cop or anything, and, 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 and quiet as it's kept, that's a whole different scenario. But I just think that they, they blew it there, and I think that there should be some accountability because I, I believe several people were culpable there, you know. And I don't know, it's just my opinion, but I just think, like I said, in the Walmart shooting and, and the Tamir Rice shooting, the kid, you know, these tactics out there, I don't know what is happening with the training. I don't know if they're being trained properly. That's one thing LAP right. did. We train, we train. That was one of our, uh, they call it core value, core values. It's tenuous training. You have to tr train because life changes. The world changes. You know, you, you have to continuously train and become better and get better. You know, I can remember uh, a lot of coppers. We, we, we had this thing called cultural uh, of sensitivity training. There's a guy that had a thing called verbal judo. And what it was was it was um, something that the department bought off on in terms of giving officers sensitivity training to deal with making us more sensitive to different cultures and, and just figuring out how we could do some problem solving without going in there beating the crap out of everybody and choking people and, and, and ultimately shooting or something like that, you know. But it worked out well. But initially... When you go into class, people are like, ah, I don't want to do this. This is politically correct, and why, why do we got to do this? And But when, you know, there were 50, 40 or 50 officers in each class, and they were really participating, and, and I definitely saw that there was a need for that. You know, it gave us another option, you know, as opposed to just running in there and just beating people up that, you know, didn't uh, do what you said on the first time, but... I don't know. We got some work to do with law enforcement, and uh, I, I think uh, community policing is is the only way to do it. Like I said, we're we're at a uh, standoff now, and thank God for the president. He sees a need for uh, work on this problem because it, it it's a problem that has to be worked on, and I think both sides. Uh, I, I I see the community. I think they're willing to sit down, but when you see the arrogance of some of these police union reps and some of the police officers, to me it's just deplorable. You know, it's like, come on, guys. Man, I totally well, agree. You know what, if, if it, you know, you, you've got to sit down at the table. At least act like right. you can do it. And they got some guys that are willing to do that. I saw a picture today. Uh, they had several policemen that had turned their backs in the New York, uh, one of the, uh, Officer Lou's funeral. They turned their back on the mayor. And they had one lone... New York guy that didn't. And I wrote in there that, you know, a real man doesn't succumb to peer pressure. Uh, and it, it took a lot of uh, nerve to do that, you know, but I commend that, that officer because it was, I'm telling you, it was like 50 guys and he was right in the middle of them and they all turned their backs and he didn't, you know, but that that's arrogant and that's irresponsible and I, I think it's immature to do something like that, you know. It's like humble yourself and you got your police commissioner. Commissioner Bratton is, is against it. And, you know, uh, you're a member of his department. And he's he's the head, and he's not going for it. You know, and I know some, I'm sure they have some managers that are under Bratton that are not going for it either. You know, but that's something we got to work on. We definitely, 
have to sit Scotty, down at the uh, table. Question for you uh, from Twitter at Jades wants to know if you saw Wade Robson at the trial, and if so, what was his body language? Did you detect that he was being deceptive? From at Jades at Twitter. Um, I saw him at at Michael Jackson's trial. Yeah, is that what they're saying? Is it- Yes, did you get a chance to see his body language? And if so, do you feel he was being truthful back then? I I, I saw him. He he, he came off very uh, trustworthy and, and honest to me. Uh, he seemed relaxed. Uh, I'm not one of those experts, those body language experts, but uh, just based on what I saw, <laughs> he was a very... He seemed confident, and you can tell when people are BSing. You know, he didn't seem like that. He he stood up under cross examination. He did very well. He seemed I heard it was confident. a rough cross examination. It was a rough yeah. cross examination, according to Tom Mehrer, and he was yeah. he stood strong. And you were in there. And and the way he stood, from my memory, is that oh, okay, this guy's he's a good witness. He squared away, but he stood under their cross examination, and those were seasoned. Um, uh, you know, attorneys, those guys weren't no uh, first-year attorneys, you know. Um, but I, I remember his disposition, and he came off, you know, quite trustworthy to me. If if I was a juror, I'd believe him. He was believable to me. You know, now he's changed his mind or had a change in heart, so that's going to be interesting. Yeah, he definitely had a change of heart, and uh, he is uh, asking for in the neighborhood of 10 to $15 million. Uh, that could change some people's heart. It's a shame uh, Michael Jackson actually came out with the song Anything for Money, and uh, it seems so ever true. Wow. That's is great. that what he's asking for? Is that that's the damage? That's what the did? lawyers, yes, that's what I heard from some sources. I, I don't know that for 100%, but that's the rumor. Wow. At least. Yeah, that's um, amazing. Money will money will make you do some crazy things, I tell you. It's, it's sad. I... I when I heard that that initial, you know, allegation and from from him, it's like, oh my god, I, I couldn't you believe were stunned. that. I was, I really was. Uh, at MJ Moonwalker wants to know uh, if you think Chris Tucker was the uh, smoky, well, the magic uh, witness that helped uh, my, uh, quit Michael Jackson. I guess they're saying how big a role was Chris Tucker. In Michael's acquittal, I wouldn't get a say, chance. No, I was no. He he wasn't. Uh, he had he testified, and I think he did quite well. But I wouldn't say he was the one that did it. I think all of them were very good. Uh, I think uh, the preparation. Um, I think Tom Mesero in preparing his witnesses. Uh, I think his line of questioning, and I also think the truth. The truth is what. The people, Debbie Rowe had some amazing testimony. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, she, you know, she was from the state. Yeah, she, yeah, she, did an, uh, she did an amazing job. And I don't know if, if we called Debbie Rowe or if the prosecution did. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, she did an amazing job. I think Macaulay Calkin did an amazing job, you know. Um, yes. Yeah, Wait, I Thompson think she did an amazing job. job. Yeah, Wade, <laughs> Wade Robinson did an amazing job too. Just from based on what I saw, and I, I saw all of the testimony, Chris being some dynamic uh, testimony. You know, I, I really don't. Yes, this is from Kathy Guzman uh, Guliano via Facebook. How does Kerry deal with common criminals, career criminals, and his standard take techniques? for takedowns. How do I deal with common criminals and my, the way I I take them down? Yeah, how how do you deal with everyday common criminals? And I guess the question uh, is, uh, if you were in that situation where you had to take somebody down, what would be your method, I guess, they're trying to ask? Well, one, one of the things that I always did, I thank God I'm retired now, I don't, take guys down now, I still can, but <laughs> I, I, I don't do that on a daily basis now. But when I was doing it uh, at a very frequent uh, time with the Los Angeles Police Department, I always used my uh, tactics. You know, I used my resources. 
uh, I use patience, and I use dignity and respect. You know, the first line of force always starts out, or the first level of force always starts out with verbalization. Sir, I need you to turn around and put your hands behind your back. Sometimes it ended right there. I mean, and, and uh, some of the calls that I never will forget, I got a guy right at uh, Pico and La Brea, and this guy was an uh, African-American gentleman. Uh, they said he had on no shirt, and he was swinging a machete on the corner. I turned the corner, and there he was with the machete in his hand. And this guy was big. This guy, actually, he was very tall. I'd say he was about six, six five. But it was a hot summer, and, and it, it was a typical PCP kind of guy. He had this crazy look on his face. He had a machete in his hand. And uh, I still approached him um, with dignity and respect as much as I could. Um, but I said, sir, I need you to turn around and put that thing on the ground. Now, I also had a shotgun in my hand because at the particular time, you, I don't deal with a person like that swinging a machete at me where that's not a taser kind of time because if the taser doesn't work, you cut. But I guarantee you uh, the 12-gauge uh, Ithaca shotgun would, would handle it. But guess what? When I told him to turn around, put his, drop that weapon, he did exactly that. So to answer the question, you, I, you would always use tactics. You always use uh, verbalization first. Sir, I need you to do this. Ma'am, I need you to do this. Sometimes it ends there. Sometimes it doesn't. Now, in that particular case, he had a machete, so I had to deploy my shotgun. And had he not adhered to what I was saying, we probably would have had an officer involved shooting at the time. But thank God it didn't work out like that. So everything is on a case-by-case -case basis. I've also been in the situations where you think that it's not going to be uh, – I, I remember one, of the, remember one of the fights that uh, I had on the job, and it was a – Full blown. It was in a, a real high end dental office, and it was a patient that had actually had some dentist work or dental work done, but uh, he refused to leave, and and he was uh, kind of dis disturbing the peace. So we get there, and I'm thinking, okay, this is a nice dentist office, real high end, and man, I tell you, we tore that place up. But it was like a UFC fight. <laughs> you know, we were we were fighting until you know he actually submitted and I put handcuffs on him but it was a long fight and thank God I was in physical shape and I was strong enough to deal with that because until the cavalry comes to help you're on your own you know so you have to exactly. be you know physically prepared you have to be mentally prepared and then and I always did another thing and I prayed I, you know because sometimes you get some of these people out here and especially now uh, there's some bad dudes walking the street you look at some of these guys and some of these, these gyms, these UFC ultimate fight kind of gyms all over the place, it's a very dangerous place out there. You know, so you really have to be mentally and physically prepared. I think uh, right. it's incumbent upon that you, on a police officer to stay in shape, to continuously train, to work out, uh, to prepare yourself mentally and physically. And then you you um, you got to be smart, too. You can always wait additional resources before you even engage a person like that. You know, um, like I say, in in the Eric Garner case, there's no way I would have tried to take him down without a taser. I don't care how long it would have taken for the taser to get there. And maybe by the time that the taser was being brought, you could have talked this guy, you know, calmed him down, you know, that, that kind right. of thing. But there's right. all kind of ways of, of taking people down. But I always started it off as a rule with verbalization. Sometimes it can go from verbalization to uh, uh, pain compliance, wrist lock, twist lock, to a baton or a taser, and then it can get into the deadly forces. But sometimes it can go right from, sir, I need you to do this. Like, I'll give you a perfect example. Had that guy not jo dropped that machete, it could have gone to deadly force. So it would have gone from, sir, I need you to do this, to boom. And you would have had an officer involved shooting, which probably would have resulted in his death. But, you, you still have to be accountable for everything that you do, you know, and your street tactics, your officer survival tactics will uh, help you out tremendously, you know, so. Absolutely. We have a question from the chat room, Nancy. In 1990, wants to know, 
what Kerry thought of June Chandler's testimony, uh, the witness that was from 93, the mother of the 93 uh, child. Uh, I don't. Yeah, you're talking about Gordy Chandler's mother. I, I don't really know. I, I don't have a lot of details about about that. I know that whole thing was a farce, and they they were something. I know something about the people, but I didn't exactly hear uh, her actual testimony, so I couldn't really expound on that at all. I couldn't give you an opinion. And they ask, um, they follow up with, uh, did he personally uh, talk to you about any of these witnesses? Or any of the eleven oh eight uh prior bad acts, uh did he talk to you basically uh, um about the case. Maybe when it was over. Did you ever uh, have a like a sit down no, with you? We, and, we had conversa- you know? yeah, we've had conversations about it and uh, you know, the, the, some of the moments that Michael would call me early at night it would it would really be bothering him and this was in the uh the uh, uh Arviso trial, but he would always refer back to, you know, it's like, why are they doing this to me? I didn't do that with Gordy Chandler, and he would get into, he explained to me what, what that whole thing was about a couple of times. Oh, really? So it was more of a, yeah, it was more of a, he was like, why are they doing this to me? And and, and it was when I was trying to teach him about uh, agape love and, and loving your enemies, because I, I when I saw this whole thing, and when Tom Mesro explained it to me, and and both both uh, child molestation issues, and and then when I saw the actual court proceedings a few days, I said, "Oh my God, we gotta pray, man, because this is something that's bigger than uh, your money. It's bigger than I mean, when you got the court system doing violating Fourth Amendment rights and search and seizure, and then." Mesero would bring it to the court's attention, and it's like, you know, that didn't happen. It's like, oh, my God, <laughs> we're in for an uphill battle. Well, when I'm in for an uphill battle, you, you got, you've got to get spiritual with them. you got to go to a higher source. And I just remember how Michael broke down several times, and it, it was so sad. That's why I say some of the memories. It wasn't all good being with, with Michael. It was some very sad times to see a man broken and to see such a sweet human being broken because of what people were doing to him and destroying his character. And then for you to know that you're in this particular situation and this predicament, and you know you didn't do anything, it's like, wow. But yet you're still in the system, you know, and you don't even know if you're going to win this case or not, you know. So it was was a difficult... Oh my You'd God! Dead, sometimes, right? man, I, I would. Yeah, sometimes I really had to. Uh, a couple times, you know, when I didn't know, uh, because I didn't trust the judicial system up there. I didn't trust Judge Melville. I didn't trust the prosecutors at all. You know, so right. Like I said, when when that really so happens, you Tom have to go to certain certain. Yeah, yeah, Tom. it was ridiculous, especially when I saw some of the the ways they. They uh, illegally searched his residence and, and violated his Fourth Amendment rights and certain things, and it's like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> and then, like I said, a lot of Tom Mesero, yeah, for Tom Mesero to really? so eloquently challenge these things and then get rejected, it's like, whoa, okay, it's time for God. We're gonna we're gonna put God on this thing, you know. So, but it was a challenge. <laughs> We have uh, Marie Armstrong from the chat. Uh, did Michael Jackson ever talk to you about those uh, maids, uh, specifically They're from uh, the 93 uh, that flipped on him? The maids that did what? On him, basically. Turned on him. No, I don't. I don't. And from the 93 trial? The 93 no, area. Uh, yeah. No, no, I think he didn't make the no. testify. No, I don't remember any maids testifying in our trial, but but I I know um, I don't know if that happened in in the ninety three trial. I know the maids that we had that were, were very you know very loyal and very good people. You know, they, I know they didn't they didn't even testify. The maids when when I was around, uh, 
the mates that were in at Neverland, um, I know that they didn't even testify, so I don't know. I'm not familiar with the 93 testimony or uh, depositions or anything like that. But he never discussed that with me anyway. And uh, we also, Nancy, want to know, uh, the people that had sued Michael Jackson in the 90s, uh, and uh, they they claimed that Macaulay Culkin and uh, others, uh, all these people that were um, against Michael, the Neverland Five, I guess they call him, um, what's your thoughts on them? Did Michael ever talk to you about them? They're asking. If I understand your question, are you saying people that sued Michael Jackson? I didn't understand your yes. question. Yes, yeah, so back in the 90s, there was all these security guards. There were housemaids. There were just a bunch of uh, people jumping on their train after that other, so with Jordy Chandler. Did, uh, first of all, your opinion about that, second of all, did Michael ever sit down and have a talk to you about all these people, the Neverland Five, the, which the, they call the uh, Adrian McManus, uh, people like that, uh, Ralph no. Cohen, all these never spoke no, to you about I, that? I, no, Michael, Michael never discussed that with me, and uh, I, I'm not even familiar with, with all of those people. I'm, I've never heard that story before. You know, I'm, I'm really not. They were uh, they allegedly I, stole from Michael. They sued he sued them and won a settlement against them, and then they became prosecution witnesses, and wow, uh, they no. lost that wa lawsuit to yeah. Michael. Yes, uh, the uh, we had uh, somebody else with the question. The uh, last time you were on the show, you indicated that uh, there were some serious threats on verdict day. Um, can you get more into that, and how many threats would you say there were coming from Marie Armstrong via uh, the chat? Death threats on June thirteenth. Yeah, there were there were not only threats on June, not only threats on June thirteenth. There were several threats throughout the the trial, uh, several times, um, and um, but the the ones the the ones on June thirteenth were. I don't know. They just kind of bugged me a little bit, uh, and uh, they, one indicated that even if he was acquitted, they was going they were going to kill Michael before he reached the car. And quite naturally, that is not a protected area. Um, you know, it's not. It, it's a nightmare in terms of my expertise and, and me protecting a client because everything was so wide open. And then there were a couple of things that I'll go into when I talk in my book about certain weird things that happened that day that normally the, the, the sheriffs were pretty cooperative with me up there, but that particular day I asked them to do something that was, uh, you know, I, when I go into, I, I was countering any particular uh, assassination attempt. With, with some things that I knew that I wanted to do, and they wouldn't allow me to do that. And that was just kind of weird to me. But, you know, it, it worked out well, obviously. Uh, he lived through that moment. Okay, that and, and of course, it, yes, um, MJ helped a maid, uh, you said, last time with 80 grand uh, for her sick child, and then she came and testified in, in court, Adrian McManus, blah, 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 blah. Did the police take them seriously? Uh, is one part of the question, and help you in any way? No, I'm sorry. Did the police take them serious? Did you the, the testimony of these people? Uh, did you get a chance to to see them? Like that that maid that you spoke about last time you were on the show who uh, oh absolutely who I saw her go up and yeah I saw her testify. And uh, I saw her testify in the direct and then cross-examination. Um, and uh, I hadn't heard of that prior to that. I, I didn't know that she was coming on. But uh, Tom Mesereau did an amazing job on her. And I'm sure uh, 
I, I kind of viewed myself as a juror because I wanted to be very just right in the middle. I didn't want to be one way or the other. Yeah, very impartial. And um, Tom Mesro filleted this lady. Oh, my God. I, and to me, it's like <laughs> the, the prosecution, those guys were, I don't know, I, I just can't believe that they did some of the things that they did. They didn't do their work, their homework, because I wouldn't put a witness, I wouldn't call one of my witnesses that is supposed to help my case, and they get totally blown off the face of the earth, you know, uh, just with basic information. And had they researched uh, what she was testifying about, they would have known that, and they didn't. But Tom Mesro sure brought it out. It was an amazing uh lawyering on Tom Mesereau's part and, and Susan Yu. Uh, I think this question from uh, Ned Forster is, did the prosecution go after MJ primarily because he uh, either he was black or his celebrity, in your opinion? You know, I, I, I really don't know. Uh, I think uh, just based on my research, I think uh, Tom Snedden had a personal vendetta. He He wanted to make I guess, name recognition by ultimately getting Michael Jackson. Uh, he tried it on, I guess, two occasions, and it, it never worked. But um, I think that may have something to do with it. Uh, Michael Jackson, his uh, celebrity, as well as his ethnicity, um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't believe it was fair. You know, I, I think he overstepped his bounds as a prosecutor. Uh and I think he abused his power. I really do. Um, and I don't know why. I, I don't know what kind of beef Tom Mesro had with Michael Jackson prior to that. You know, how can you just hate a person? But some people are sick, you know, so I don't know. It, oh, yeah. He is sick. If if that was his motives for uh, ruin a man, ruining a man's life and taking a man's uh, away from his family... And taking his finances away, shame on him, you know. But it obviously you know, Luna didn't Joe work. uploaded a video that showed Tom Sveden, uh falsely uh, arrested somebody in 2001, had them in jail, was the wrong person, and then uh, they got out, and then they they tried to sue. I don't I, I don't know the whole story offhand, but uh, he was not well liked in that town. Uh, by yeah. <laughs> obviously the criminals, but he did some shady things, according to a lot of people, uh, Mr. Tom Sneddon. Finally, before we get out of here, your thoughts on uh, comedian Bill Cosby and these allegations, uh, now up to about 30 uh, women are coming out and saying uh, that Bill Cosby uh, raped him. Your thoughts? You know, I don't know. It's it's so sad. I don't have enough information about it to really expound on it. Uh, it, it there's some serious issues. Uh, a lot of them are saying kind of like the same thing. You know, we always, when we went out and investigated crimes, one of the main things you do is check on a modus of operandi. And, and it's the way in which a criminal does things. And a lot of them are saying this drug thing, putting some in the drink, and then the sexual, inappropriate sexual behavior after that. So... I really don't know, though. I, I can't, because I don't know the character of some of these uh, witnesses. Uh, right. I don't know what their motives are, um, so I, I can't really make a, a fair assessment about it. And I don't know Bill Cosby. You know, I, I know that there's been some tragedies in his life. I was actually uh, in the room when, uh, when Police Chief Willie Williams was talking to uh, Bill Cosby about his son Ennis being murdered in, in Los Angeles. I was there when that happened, but I, I I really don't know Bill Cosby, and I don't know any of these people, you know. And I I don't really want to make a an assessment one way or the other because I I don't have enough information. And I just I tell you what, it's it's pretty suspect when you got so many people that <laughs> I don't know if these That's people the these people yeah you these know, women don't Jackson I don't think had, they know each other, you know. And you know, Mike was only uh, accused. Of uh, one one primarily uh, person in 2005, even though yeah. they tried to say there were three, but three is nowhere yeah. compared to putting another zero. I mean, 30 yeah. is a whole family. I mean, that, that's a I know. big difference. I, I, I tell you what, I would hate to be, 
you know, Bill Cosby has got to be 70, 75 years old. I'd hate to be 77, the latter stages of my life going through this kind of crap, you know. So I, I, I really don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, You know, like I said, a statement that Martin Luther King said, truth crushed to earth will one day rise again. So if he did something bad, he's going to be handled, you know. <laughs> I, I tell you what, he's he's had a bad month the last two months. I'd hate to be in his shoes. And I feel oh, for his yeah, wife. But at too, least you he's know, not like, sitting and eating uh, uh, sandwiches uh, with uh, bread and mortar, you know. He does yeah. anything to avoid that. Uh, you know, yeah. you, you you be in a form of policeman, you know, uh, the <laughs> ins and outs of yeah. uh, jail. And, you know, I, I'd rather just be where he is now than be in anywhere part of prison. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. But, uh, I really do. <laughs> You know, good, uh, uh, King George, you guys have a uh, former mayor or former governor, Mario Como. His, uh, yes, he just passed on. Memorial yes, service yes, is, yes, is tomorrow. I'd like to express my condolences to, to his family. I know he was an advocate for peace. He always talked about the proliferation of nuclear uh, weapons, and uh, he, he just seems like a class act. Yeah, so I'd like to express my condolences to, to his family and... Uh, yeah, did the Omo uh, and Ramos? Yeah. Yes, Officer yes. Let's get to them. Well. Let's touch on them. What's yeah. your thoughts on that? You know, the guy it's just sad, took them out, man. basically. It, it is. It is so sad. But it, it gets back to what I was saying. Whenever you have two opposing sides that are refusing to talk in a adversarial kind of setting, man, that's called war. And, you know, war is always going to result in a casualty, and it's unfortunate. Um, but if we don't do something about this law enforcement, and it's not just a white-black thing either. You know, people say that, but it, it's not, you know. Uh, if we don't do something about bettering the relationships between law enforcement and the communities they serve, then we're going to have war, you know, and... Like I said, every life is precious. It's not black lives matter, white lives. All lives matter. Police lives, white lives, black lives, all lives matter, you know. So I just, you know, wanted to to um, mention that. We got to do something. And I, I feel bad, you know, I really do, because um, I think police officers are getting a bad rep, but there's some police officers doing some stupid stuff. So we got to get rid of the bad guys on both sides. You know, I think the criminals that are recidivists and, and that refuse to be productive members of society and and, and, and just uh, bad guys, they, they have to go to jail. But the same thing works for the police officers. If you have been entrusted in that particular position, I think you should be held to a higher standard. And uh, I, I, I think you're just as, to me, you're worse than a criminal, because you know better, you know, for you to be out there abusing your authority and your power, it's, it's just not good, and I don't think it's, uh, there's any place for you in, in modern-day policing, I really don't, so. Absolutely. I uh, hope you come back next month on the show, as we get closer well, to I'm your not. book arrival. Yeah, uh, I a great I episode. Love to come back. Yeah. Episode uh, I, is I, very I informative. Really Really enjoyed it, and uh, anytime, uh, Jordan, you need me to come back, just just let me know. Hopefully, uh, and your uh, Facebook page, your the official Facebook page is what? Uh, it's uh, www. Uh, slash k a agape love. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, Kerry, thanks a million for joining us. We will speak to you in about a month. Okay, King John, how's your mom doing? Is she doing better? I, I hope she is. I've been praying for her and hope she, she's doing better. She's coming along. She's coming along. You know, I did see that. You, I don't know if you caught with Stuart Scott. That was really sad. Uh, yeah, the FPN, it was. Only 49 yeah. years old. Yeah, it's too early to go, man. I tell you, it really is. Yeah. Wow. Well, anyway, but, uh, yes, enjoy your years, sir, sir, sir and, and thanks for having me, yes. and, and God bless you, and I'm continue to uplift your mom in prayer as well. Oh, I appreciate that. God bless you. Uh, 
Peace, love, and happiness to you and your family. All right. Thank All you, right. Terry. Thanks a lot. Take care. Okay. Thanks a million to Terry Anderson. Just want to thank everybody for listening tonight. We have a big show uh, tomorrow night with Wrestling Talk at 9 p.m. Thursday, Robbie Ludwig. A week from Thursday, we have Beth Karras and Ann Bremner. Once again, a big shout-out to Terry Anderson. Uh, he's one of the best folks, and be on the lookout for that book. Be an awesome one. Thank you for listening. We'll speak to you tomorrow. Thank you.